I think when we began the series on Timothy, and we talked about 1 Timothy, now we're into 2 Timothy, I said that when I began a ministry in St. Ives 4th Street as a Methodist lay pastor, this book meant a huge amount to me. The reason it meant such a lot to me was I felt Paul was addressing me as a young minister, a young pastor, and telling me how I should conduct myself and how I should conduct the affairs of the church. Now, I've chosen to read this morning from the New American Standard Bible. So it may be slightly different to yours, but the words will come up on the screen. It's 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13 to 18. And part of me feels this is one of the most important messages I'll ever give in my life. That's how important what Paul is saying. This chapter, these letters, have directed my whole life in the ministry. That's how important they are. I deliberately chose the New American Standard Bible, although I'm going to give you other references and other translations, because I think this is the best one. Retain the standard of sound words, which you have heard from me, in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard, through the Holy Spirit, who dwells in us, the treasure which has been entrusted to you. You are aware of the fact that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom Phygelus and Hermogenes. The Lord grant mercy to the house of Onesphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. For when he was in Rome, he eagerly searched for me and found me. The Lord grant to him to find mercy from the Lord on that day, And you know very well what services he rendered at Ephesus. I want to pay tribute to two godly men that have affected my life. One by his writings and one on the rare occasion when I ever saw him speak. Roger Forster was the leader of the Ipswich Christian Fellowship. He started off in Honour Park Brethren Assembly. Roger died last week. 91. Roger Foster was the first man I ever saw preach. By the way, this is not a comment on any other technique that preachers use. You must use what's right for you. But Roger spoke without looking at his notes at all. I later found out because my wife attended that church and she knew his private secretary that he would preach the sermon on Thursdays, the whole sermon to his personal secretary to memorise it. And I realise that if you can look up from your notes and look at people when you speak, it may have more impact upon them. So I pay tribute to Roger Forster. The second person I'm going to pay tribute to is Francis Schaeffer. I never met Francis Schaeffer, but I read his material. Francis Schaeffer once said... The truth we have in the Bible is true truth. It's not false truth. Why did he use two words to talk about truth when I ought to be able to say truth and you all understand it? Because truth is cheapened today in society. It's twisted and you can be misled by people who say they're telling you the truth but they're actually telling you a mixture of truth or even downright lies. What is true truth? Now, some of you have a Bible with you. If you have a Bible with you, would you put it in your hand like I put mine? Now, you will see that you have four fingers one side of your Bible and you have one the other side that's holding it. If I was to take my thumb away, I would drop the Bible on the floor. I demonstrated this nearly 25 years ago and a young man came to me and said, I'm upset with you. I said, why is that? Because you dropped the Bible on the floor and the Bible is an important book, so I'm not going to do that ever again. The 
point is this. You read the Bible, you hear it preached, you study it, you memorize it. Most important thing is to meditate upon it or you'll never get a grip of it the way God wants you to. The thumb stands for meditation on the scripture, which is when you take a verse or a passage, as Paul has been led to share a passage that meant a lot to him this week, and Peter, the passage that the Holy Spirit emphasizes to you as you read it every day. You do read it every day, don't you? I've never met a strong Christian who doesn't. If you want to be a strong Christian, you need the word saturated into your head and your whole way of thinking. If you meditate upon it, it becomes part of you. That's the old navigator's teaching that we were given as young Christians, five ways to take in the Bible. Meditation is the thumb that holds the book. Right, what is true truth? This is a summary of what Schaefer said. Number one. True truth is for everyone in every age and generation. I don't care how old you are. Well, I do in a way. Don't be silly. Or how young you are, but I do really. But it doesn't matter what age you are, you need the word. And the reason you need the word is because it's the only place you are going to get objective, ultimate truth in any society and particularly this one. The second thing is, it's always under assault. There are always people criticizing and rubbishing the Bible. I'm going to give two examples in a moment. This week we went with some friends to a restaurant not far away. There are other restaurants available. This one's called Tricky's. And outside Tricky's is an anvil, a black anvil. Do you know the Bible is an anvil? Everything that's ever been hammered against it has worn out and the anvil remains. Third thing about true truth, it's expressed from God himself. The Puritans said, and I've said it in the pulpit, when you open the Bible, you open God's mouth. You open the mouth of God who speaks to you. That's how important it is. Fourth thing, the Bible, true truth, shares God's character, his will and his glory and exalts the Lord Jesus Christ as the full essence, the full manifestation, read today by Peter from Hebrews, the full representation of Almighty God. All the fullness of God dwells bodily in the Lord Jesus. Wesley said he could preach Jesus from every text in the Bible. I don't think I could, but I know what he means. Every single aspect of scripture is to encourage all of you in your worship and exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the next thing about true truth. True truth being biblical truth. It always holds together. It holds together the truth and it also holds together how you apply it. You all know what James said. Don't just be listeners to the Bible, but be people who carry it out in your life. It's the only way to be spiritually transformed. The Holy Spirit loves the Bible. You've all heard the famous three-line cliche. All word and you dry up. All spirit and you blow up. Word and spirit, you grow up. You haven't heard that before. It's quite a helpful thing to bear in mind. Now, here's examples. People who preach the Bible faithfully will be denounced as dictators, as tyrants, as idiots and deluded people and even nutters. Some of you will know that I get given books for book aid. Inside one of the books was an article from 2011 by the person who would have been boss of me when I was at Four Street Methodist Church, but I had resigned before he became in charge. This is what he wrote in 2011. Sam Harris, the American equivalent of our Richard Dawkins, keeps pushing the statistic that 40% of American Christians believe that Jesus will return and the world will end within the next 20 years or so. 
I don't think we've got too much of that nutty Christianity in the UK, but we've certainly got some, and these weird Adventist ideas are around. Last two paragraphs. Am I taking it literally as end of the world, rapture, second coming, goodness knows what, as per the fundamentalists, and that American crank a few months ago is not what it's about, not if you read the codes properly. So please, let's have some sanity in our faith and some decent Bible study, lest we get deceived by false teaching and bring our Christianity into disrepute, just as the fundamentalists have brought theirs. I'm glad he wasn't my boss. I'm a nutter. This church is nutty because it actually believes in the literal second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. You could say, well, that was written in December 2011. You're talking old hat, Andrew. Oh, no, I'm not. Today's article, From Grain of Sand, blog by Campbell Jack, a wonderful Christian brother in the Lord, The Struggle for the Soul of the Church of England. Here we have the nub of the matter. Our woke ecclesiastics want a theology which countenances the word of God only when his word agrees with what they want anyway. Scripture must appear before the bar of their desires and either conform or be found guilty and dismissed. When they say that evangelicals are a threat to the church, what they really mean is that evangelicals are a threat to the ecclesiastical elite self-regarding rule of the church and their imposition of a modern non-biblical ideology onto the millennia-hold theology of the church. It was ever thus. Sir Thomas More complained that William Tyndale, who translated the Bible into English and was murdered because of it, and that's why you have an English translation you can read. William T. Tyndale put concern for the Bible before the concern for the established church. Amen to William Tyndale. The reformers, the Wesleys, whoever has prioritized scripture over the ecclesiastical organization, the church mandarins and their acolytes have turned on them. If you want to read the article, you can see me afterwards. Do you see now why it's so important? What Paul said to Timothy. Retain the sound words I have taught you in the love and faith of Christ Jesus. This church believes in three eyes about the Bible. One, it's fully inspired. God breathed it out. Secondly, it's infallible. You can trust it on any matter that it records. The only lies in the Bible out of the mouth of Satan or wicked men. God never tells a lie, ever. He's not a man that he should lie, the Bible says. And here's the one that sometimes divide, even evangelicals, but I've held it ever since I did my Methodist church exam as a local preacher and to answer the question, in what ways is Genesis 1 to 11 myth? It's inerrant. It is absolutely true and right about everything it asserts. Its science is right. Its history is right. Its philosophy is right. His psychiatry is right. Everything in scripture is without error because it comes from the mouth of God. Who says amen to that? Good, I'm glad you do. It's incredibly important. Now we'll get to the text. So if you have your Bible, or um, Janice would like to put up that first verse, verse 13, from the New American Standard Bible. Most of this talk will be about that. Then I'm going to talk about the sadness of betrayal which Paul suffered, and the one man who stood with him on this before us. Here are some alternative translations to this key verse. The authorised version says, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou heardest from me. The New King James says, Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me. The Good News Bible says, Hold firmly to the true words that I taught you. The easy read version says, what you heard me teach is an example of what you should teach. And the ESV says, follow the pattern of the sound words 
that you have heard from me. The New American Standard Bible puts retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Now there have been some wonderful men who have led this church as one present here today. Those men all stood for the truth of the gospel and for the truth of God's word. They passed it on. I have a responsibility now before God to pass on this message to the next generation of people who will lead this church. I don't know who they will be. I might have in my head a few ideas, but I'm not going public with them. This church will not survive, nor does it deserve to survive, if it gives up the true message of God's word. The only way it's going to survive is if it stands firm, as Timothy was told. Now, when Paul writes this, he's in a terrible prison. In the prison in Rome, you could be forced underground 12 feet down, totally isolated, absolutely cold, with no one caring about you, and deliberately forgotten. And yet Paul, in the last thing that he wrote, this is the last thing that Paul wrote in the Bible, is so concerned, not for himself, but for the glory of God, and for the importance of Scripture, that he urges, he almost compels, he pleads, he loves Timothy enough to say, this is what you have to do, Timothy, the apostolic doctrine, the apostolic gospel is resting on you and people like you because soon they will execute me probably by chopping my head off. That's how important it is. That's how serious it is. That's why it involves every one of us. This is a military command. It's like a sergeant major saying to the soldiers, I order you to do this. Pick up your musket, Sam, etc., etc. This is an order from God. Through his mouthpiece, the apostle. So I can order anyone who is a preacher or is feeling a call to be a minister in any way in the word, including the Sunday school teachers, most of whom have gone downstairs, I can say to them, this is what you have to do. You have to pass this truth that people gave their life for so that the next generation hear it. What they do with it is their responsibility. My responsibility, and trust me, everyone who preaches in this church, is to pass on the truth. Even if we are called nutters for doing it, or a bunch of boring old fundamentalists down there, or even people who believe in the second coming, let's mock that. The Bible says we'll mock people. People will be mocked for believing that Jesus is coming back. We'll be waiting for 2,000 years. Where is he, Andrew? Ha, ha, ha. He's coming, and he could be coming soon, and I'm with Paul 100%. He could come today, for even the imminence of Jesus Christ's return. So, therefore, it's incredibly important, isn't it? The Trinity is mentioned in these verses. God's mentioned. The Lord Jesus Christ is mentioned and the Holy Spirit. In verses 13 to 14, you can, up on the screen there, you can see all those mentioned. There's actually two of them. This is a Trinitarian command. So how could God make that more important than to say, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all involved in this command to you, Timothy. I'm going to have to say, I don't think you get a better witness in the highest court in the land than the Trinity of God. That's how important it is. And it's said in the continuous tense. So this is something you continuously need to do. So this church in every generation, every set of elders, and every so often in a sermon has to remind the preacher who's preaching it and everyone listening this is important. This is what you do every day of your life. You maintain and retain and hold fast the scriptures of God. 
If you get rid of them, there's no foundation. The psalmist said, if the foundation of the righteous is destroyed, what will the righteous do? Judeo-Christianity, the ethics that built this country, are under immense attack. I wrote a letter this morning to appear in the realm because the Christian Institute asked me to. The address is Lord Mayor. My wife saw the envelope and thought I'd write into the mayor. <laughs> I haven't tried writing to him yet. Lord Mayor, will you please understand, Lord Mayor, that when Baroness, and I can't remember her name, brings in a private member's bill to force conversion therapy ban upon us all, I will be criminalised and locked up for telling someone who genuinely wants to change from their sinful lifestyle and encourage them to repent, I could be arrested for it if they pass this bill. You don't understand what I'm talking about? Get on the Christian Institute website and have a look for yourself. You might be sitting there thinking, I've never heard anything like this ever before. So I wrote him a letter. And I told him, in the congregation, I have people who are trying to transition back to what they were, and they can't afford to do it. You're going to criminalize me for supporting them in that. You see how important this is now? Do you realize it's not just... Let's have a nice time. I've got no problem with the worship. I've thoroughly enjoyed worshipping God this morning. Beautiful new song. Really enjoyed singing that. But this is serious. Because this involves all of us. You see, I see Paul deserted by everyone in Asia except one man. If I'm put in prison, which of you will visit me? Which of you will stand with me? I know, I'm not asking for you to answer that. I'm making this as a rhetorical question. Because that's what happened to Paul. And the whole of Asia deserted him. He names two of them. Names one who doesn't. We'll come to that in a minute. So he says, retain. Retain means to hold on to it and have it in your hand always and never let it go. Never let the scripture go in your life. Hold on to it. Hold on to it. Now, most of you are using a mobile phone to look up the scriptures. The first time it ever happened in this church, I thought, who's playing games in this congregation? Well, I'm trying to preach my heart out. Then I realized, actually, they were looking up the verse. Well, that's what they told me. So if you're holding a mobile phone, you're looking at the scriptures, Good. But I hope you got one of these as well. If you haven't got one, we've got some nice new ones at the back of the church given to us by a church that just closed down and we'll give you one. The man handed them all to me and I thought, we'll use those in our own church. God bless him and his fellowship that couldn't continue. Standard. The word standard is a pattern. It's an outward form of a reliable guide So it's saying, stay within the boundaries of the word of God. Don't compromise on the scripture. Don't bend the scripture. Don't twist the scripture. Stay within the boundaries of the word of God. Timothy, you have to do this. However timid you are and you have to take some drinks sometimes because you've got nervous problems in your stomach, I'm telling you, this is what you have to do, Timothy. You have to hold on to the reliable guide. The New Testament's being written. You'll soon have it. You need to hold on to it. And the words. Retain the standard of sound words. The words is every single God-breathed word in the scripture. And I don't take the modern approach, which is, Did God say that bit or that bit? If we don't like it, we'll get rid of that bit and we'll change it. No, God breathed the whole lot out. Every single word, precept and concept in Scripture comes directly from Almighty God. You have no right to change it. Who do you think you are? Better than God? Who does that man who wrote that article in 2011 think he is? They would call people nutters just because they believe the scripture. 
He doesn't like what it says. Loads of people out there don't like what it says. But I tell you this, when a fellowship stands on the word, those who are hungry the third, they'll turn up. Because they want to hear the truth. Specific meaning God has intended for every one of the words in the Bible. They're wholesome, they're life-giving, they're active, and they have sanctifying power. Here are two verses that back that up. Proverbs 30, verse 5 says, Every word of God proves true. Amplified Bible says, Is tried and purified perfectly. So every single word God has breathed out has gone through a purification process so that you have an accurate understanding and a translation of what God said. As Gruden said, all the modern translations are 99.9% accurate, even though they might alter the word interpretably to you in modern language, God has ensured his word is available properly to everyone. It's still the greatest seller. It's still the best seller in the world, you know. They never like to admit it. They want to put J.K. Rowling at number one or whatever it is, but it's actually the Bible. In Ukraine, when all the war kicked off, we were praying in our prayer meeting last year and we realised how many Bibles were being provided by the Ukrainian Bible Society because people desperately wanted the Bible. The only time I've been to Romania, my friend David and myself stood by his double-decker bus, which he drove over there, and gave away Bibles, and there was a queue. And a man who drove a truck who looked pretty hard, and I thought, oh dear, is he going to thump me? grabbed at least five because they really want to read what God says when they're under pressure and stress and adversity God may allow adversity sometimes in people's lives to drive them to the word Psalm 119 don't worry I'm not going to read it all I once went to a church not so far away here and the man said, what are you going to preach on? And I said, Psalm 119. He went, oh no. (laughs) But I actually chose a few bits of it. Quite like to preach on it here. It's taken about five years, so never mind. Psalm 119 verses 160 says, the sum of your word is truth. Amplified Bible, the total of full meaning of all your intended precepts and all your individual teaching." The sum of your word is truth. Brothers and sisters, when you get to glory and um, Haggai comes up to you, Haggai, and says, did you read my book? I hope you can say, I did. And Zephaniah. And Zechariah. And all the other teeny weeny ones, including Philemon. So if you do meet them in heaven, and I think you will, and they do ask you, did you read my book? You can say, yes, I've read through the Bible at least once in my life. Watchman Nee, a famous Chinese Christian, read the New Testament every three months. All the way through. Incredible. And God used Watchman Nee to build many churches and plant many strong fellowships in China. You see, if you saturate yourself in the word of God, God can mightily use you. Because your whole thinking, your whole life, is dominated by the truth. True truth. You've got to study it, meditate on it, love it, share it, apply it, exercise your faith in it, demonstrate your love for it, and exalt the Lord Jesus because of it. 2 Timothy 1, 14, guard and keep with greatest care this precious treasure. Now, I'm not a very rich person, but my younger sister decided when my mum sold her house, and I don't care, that she would like to put some of the money into silver and gold. Mum's silver and gold is nowhere near as precious as this. This is the treasure. This is the greatest treasure you could have. And I'm glad in the last coronation recently, they still handed a scripture to King Charles III and said, this is the most beautiful and wonderful gift we can give you. I didn't think they would do that, but they did. I remember in Queen Elizabeth's, which I wasn't alive at the time, but I've seen it on TV, where the Church of Scotland minister presented 
the oracles of God to Elizabeth II. The oracles of God. That's what you've got, is your greatest treasure. This is it. This is the treasure. The Holy Spirit loves this book and applies this book to everyone who will read it with a humble and a sincere heart. So we in this church are given this trust to share the scripture. We must treasure the scripture. It must be like a baton. You give it to the younger readers to treasure it too and continue to preach it. I don't know about you, but I've always liked watching athletics on TV and I especially enjoy the relay. And then so often I've watched the Eng British Olympic team in the 400 metres final, mostly in the 100 metres final, and David Coleman, whoever it is, says, and we've dropped the baton. And the Americans have won yet again. We won it once because the Americans dropped it. Don't drop the baton. Paul is saying to Timothy, don't drop the baton. God is saying to me, as a leader of this church, do not drop the baton, pass it on to the next generation. It's one of the reasons we do the academy on Monday nights. Right, now the second half of this sermon is a sad bit. It's a sad bit. There's some good parts to this. There's also some sadness in my heart. Certain people mentioned here deserted Paul. I mean, he's in prison because of the gospel. Arthur preached last week and reminded us, do not be ashamed of the gospel. I'm preaching this week, do not be ashamed of the scripture. That's an easy way to remember it. Because often after the service, we don't remember a great deal. We might be able to take one or two points. Certain people mentioned here, two of them desert Paul. They're called Hermogenes and Phygelus. If I pronounce that wrongly, forgive me. Hermogenes, I looked it up in a book I have by a wonderful scholar called Herbert Lockyer. I've pursued Herbert Lockyer's books all my life. I've got a shelf full of them. I really like Herbert Lockyer. He's so devotional and so humble. And he was a Baptist minister, so I think, oh, that's nice. <laughs> Herbert Lockyer has a book called All the Men of the Bible. By the way, he's written a book called All the Women of the Bible. Yes, but Andrew, have you got that one? Yes, I have. And I looked up at their names because Herbert Lockyer writes down everybody's names in the Bible, even the most obscure people, and he tells you what their name means. Now, this is what he says about homogenes. Something to do with the production of mercury and an alternative generation of wealth. Now, is there a clue there? Possibly there's a clue. Because Hermogenes deserts Paul because his money's at stake. Because his reputation is at stake and he's going to protect himself and he does not want to be persecuted. He does not want to be like Paul in 12 feet under the ground in a solitary cell of confinement. So he's ashamed of a man who gave his life to preach the gospel. And he walks away. I'm not going to argue whether he's saved or not. I'll leave that to another time. He walked away and he deserted the very man who brought the gospel to his area. I think that's dreadfully sad. I am extremely sad, I'm not going to mention names, of a Baptist minister who used to preach a lot at Spring Harvest and I had to write a letter to him three years ago saying, why are you conducting blessings for people who are not in biblical marriage? Never got a reply. He was the most famous Christian on television at one point. Where is he now? I don't know. 
I can actually have fellowship with him. He must hate me because I'm still trying to stand on this. Second one's called Phygelus. Herbert Lockyer says that stands for fugitive. There's a very good film called The Fugitive. We won't go down that road. A fugitive. He doesn't belong anywhere. He's searching for where he belongs. Is Phygelus' problem that he never realised that Jesus paid it all and he belonged to Jesus like we sang today? I don't know, but they deserted him. Paul's already mentioned two wonderful ladies in this book. He's mentioned Lois and Eunice, well, probably in chapter one of the first chapter, first letter and second letter. These two ladies, one is Timothy's mother, one is his grandmother, have brought Timothy up in the faith. I want to say to every Christian parent here how I admire you and we pray for you and respect you because you're seeking to bring your children up in the Christian faith. Boy, what a challenge that is, and how unusual that is, but may God absolutely bless you 100%. How wonderful that a tiny child is in this church today, because her parents think it's important to be at church and to get that little boy used to being in church. So it won't be weird for him when he's old enough to properly understand what's being said. Then there's one man who stood with him. What a lovely man. Onesiphorus. Herbert Lockyer says his name means bigging, bigging advantage or advantages. Onesiphorus refreshed Paul. I don't know whether that was because he brought him water. I don't know. But I'll tell you this. There are some Christians who absolutely refresh you every time you meet them. Sadly, there are others who just drain the life out of you. I hope you're a refresher of people. I hope when you turn up at the door, people are glad to see you because you bring with you something of the Lord Jesus and you bring refreshment to people. You don't just pile all your problems on them moan your head off and then walk away in negativity. You actually come and you refresh people. So that's very difficult, Andrew. No, if you ask the Holy Spirit to enable you, I think you could do it. A refresher. He refreshed him. He visited him. He went and he visited Paul. Now, it looks like he was in the Ephesian church or one of the churches that Paul had helped to set up all the way along and was a great helper to him. But he went, he visited him. Do you know, I go and meet people and I might be the first person, not saying this for flattery for my sake, I might be the first person who went in their house for a week. There are probably people in this congregation who never admit it, who are desperately lonely for someone to just spend some time with them. Would you do it? Or ring them up? and talk to them, and encourage them, so at least they know you care. I think somebody said this, and sometimes I've got to really think in my head how to quote this properly. People don't want to know how much you care until they know you care for them. I got that wrong, but you know what I mean. Anisiphorus encouraged Paul I mean, Paul's pretty well number one in the Christian church, in a sense. And yet, Anisophorus encourages Paul. Paul who wrote loads of the scripture. Paul who got brutalized for his faith and carried on. Paul who planted churches. Paul who set up churches. Paul's like the greatest missionary the world's ever seen, possibly. And little Anisophorus encourages him. I don't care how young a Christian you are or how old a Christian I am, you can encourage me. Every single one of you. And I should try and encourage all of you. There's a ministry I can give everyone without calling you out the front and making you fall over or anything else. I can actually give you a ministry today. It's called the Ministry of Encouragement. 
And every single Christian can exercise it. Why don't you? When COVID was on, I wrote letters to people and I put quotes from hymns in them. One lady that can't come to this church now, she's not well, has still got that card on her mantelpiece. I'm embarrassed about this, but she points to it and said, that still speaks to me now. One note, one email, one letter of encouragement to somebody else in this congregation could lift them for a week. Right, get to the end now. Resist compromise, Timothy, at all costs. You stand firm, Timothy. You hold fast, Timothy. Be brave, Timothy. Pass it on, Timothy. William Tyndale. I wanted to say something about him. William Tyndale, in the top 100 of greatest Great Britons, I think Churchill comes at one, was number 26. I think if I was going down the street of Red Roof and talked to anyone, possibly under 60, and said, have you ever heard of William Tyndale? They wouldn't have a clue. As I told you, William Tyndale gave you the English version of the Bible. And the king's men pursued him till they got him, they strangled him, then they burnt him. Why? Because the Bible, properly understood, challenges the existing structures of society and makes everyone equal in the sight of God. Amen. Whatever your colour, whatever your background, you are equal in the sight of God. That challenged the way society was formed to crush people at the bottom. Not only that, they wanted to retain the priest's hold of the scripture. But Tyndale said, I want a boy who stands behind the plough to know the Bible as well, if not better, than the priest, because most of the priests didn't preach scripture. The final prayer that William Tyndale prayed as he was burned at the stake in 1536, he prayed this. O Lord, open the King of England's eyes. Ten years after his death, or pretty soon after his death, Henry VIII, the one great thing Henry VIII did, not marry all those women, no, he put a copy of the English translation of the Bible in every parish church in England. So suddenly people heard the word in their own language and not in Latin, which most of them didn't understand. And I only got 11% in my Latin exam anyway, so I wouldn't have a clue. God answered Tyndale. Tyndale died to give me the Bible. Right, I'm going to finish with this. It is strange we trust each other and only doubt our Lord. We take the word of mortals and yet distrust his word. But oh, what light and glory would shine for all our days if we would always remember God means what he says. That's how important it is Andrew Chapel hold and retain the standard of God's word. Red Reef Baptist Church retain and hold the sound words of God. Every Christian believer here this morning retain and hold fast the word of God. If you're not a Christian, you're one prayer away, one humble prayer away from knowing this God. You call out to him to save you with all your heart and he'll do it. God bless every one of you.